Well, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. My name is Dan Lips. I'm the Director of Cyber and National Security at the Lincoln Network. I'm thrilled to be hosting our next panel on the future of cybersecurity with Eli Sugarman from the Hewlett Foundation. Eli is the Director of the Cyber Initiative at the William Flora Hewlett Foundation, where he leads a 10-year, $130 million grant-making effort that aims to build a more robust cybersecurity field and to improve policymaking. As we were just talking backstage, Eli, this is a great time to be having this panel because we're about to turn the corner, it seems, on a contentious election that many folks have been worried about in the cybersecurity community over the past four years. Um, I recall back in uh, 2016 when DHS Secretary Jay Johnson made the call out to the uh, states and others warning about election interference. It was really a new issue in the cybersecurity community. But over the past four years, we've seen um, a lot of work being done, and it seems, uh, knock on wood, that we've avoided some of the worst case scenarios of a nation state interfering with the election, uh, understanding that there's some challenges ongoing related to misinformation. Uh, I was hoping to get your view, uh, given your perspective in the cyber philanthropy community, and what lessons can we learn about this uh, national bipartisan intergovernmental effort that's continued under the leadership of, of people like Chris Krebs at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, um, and in the private sector with groups that you support um, and others. At Lincoln, we've been trying to uh, contribute to the work to en enhance the integrity of the election system. What do you think? Could, what lessons can we learn from this pretty successful effort? Yeah, no, thanks, Dan, for having me, and thanks to to Lincoln uh, for this opportunity. Uh, it is it is a timely opportunity to have this have this conversation. I think we've come a long way, right? If you remember some of the contentious, perhaps um, less than empirically driven conversations about election hacking in Georgia a few years ago, and look at what's happening in Georgia right now. Votes are being counted, democracy is working, and I think it's it's representative of what's happening across the country that um, it's really important to see how well the election has been run and administered and all of the volunteers and elections officials doing really hard work under very hard circumstances, a pandemic, a bit of loss of faith in our democracy, and they all deserve a ton of credit. And it's it's really important and impressive to see the peaceful counting of votes leading to an outcome that we're, that we're still waiting for to some degree. Um, and I think I think you know a lot of our grantees, a lot of the the civil society groups working in our cyber initiative and our democracy program at the foundation have contributed to that. And I think there's no shortage of of praise that that the civil society, government, and local officials really deserve all working hand in hand as well as the platforms. And I think I think you you do sort of highlight a really um, a good point that it's the U.S. government's approach has really evolved, and and Chris Krebs deserves credit. His colleagues at CISA, Matt Masterson, and the like have really picked up where the Obama administration, you know, um, finished, where Jay Johnson, Suzanne Spaulding, and others left off, and have really turned that into a premier agency that really sets a nice tone, being bipartisan, being collaborative, being open, working with companies, with local officials, building trust, and it really all boils down to trust because people need to know that. There's a part of the U.S. government who will help keep them safe and defend them. And in cyberspace, that hasn't always been the case. And so it's really nice to see how CISA has grown and matured and recruited talent and really um, embraced really impressive efforts like the Election Integrity Partnership that Stanford, University of Washington, several others um, throughout civil society, uh, Graphica and others have really contributed to really monitor and, and, and keep their eye on what's happening around this election and, and try to, you know, beat back all those unfortunate rumors and, and, and all of the um, you know conspiracy theories. DHS is a great website trying to counter that disinformation. And I think it's, it's nice to see that lessons were learned and that this election, I think, far exceeded everybody's expectations about how well it was run. I think certain people will like the outcome and some won't, but I think as far as how it was administered, a lot of people deserve a lot of credit. And beyond Chris Krebs, I, I, I do think the NSA under General Lacassoni and Ann Neuberger and their new director of cybersecurity deserve a lot of praise too for sort of being more transparent and open and engaging. And that, that's really what it takes. It, 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 it's, it's reaching out, it's building trust. And I think I think we've come a long way since 2016. If you were uh, Director Krebs or uh, the next director of CISA, what would you be looking to, to build upon this effort uh, to help address other areas of critical infrastructure? Uh, it seems like there's a, a lot of goodwill that's been developed um, and there's other sec sectors of the uh, economy that are probably where the election security world was four years ago. Mm -hmm. think? Yeah, so I, I think I think there are definitely you know lessons that can be applied. I think there are also big differences between elections okay. and the infrastructure there and others in that elections are run sporadically 
yeah. usually on really old antiquated tech. I mean, obviously other critical infrastructure also runs on antiquated tech, but the whole economy behind that and the incentives for investment and, and everything are, are somewhat different because there isn't actually money that comes in, right? There's, except for the vendors who are typically selling like pretty bad, you know, software and hardware, um, there isn't like a robust market there making a lot of money. So, so it's, 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 I think, a different from that perspective. But I think, I think what we have learned is that, um, you know, we need to communicate better. We need to communicate more clearly. We need to be open about what the risks are and also be open about like when there's fear mongering and people are, are sort of, you know, exaggerating those risks. And so if you think back to what people have been talking about with the grid and sort of a cyber 912 and a cyber Pearl Harbor sure. and all of these sort of exaggerated things that have not happened, we also need to be clear eyed about what the real risks are. And I think what we need is we need more things like if you take a look at the recent HBO documentary, um, The Perfect Weapon, which was the adaptation of, of David Sanger's book, we need ways like that to really connect with just average internet users and consumers to demystify this stuff, to take the magic and hocus pocus out of it and anchor it to understand like, oh, I understand how a hospital could be targeted and what that means to me. And if I'm a voter, if, if I have other you know ways that I'm getting involved, what are the real things that I care about and I want my leaders to care about? And so I think I think there's a there's a public education and awareness that's happened a bit with elections that's still in the other critical infrastructure space is lacking. Um, I also think, to be honest with you, what you've seen with elections is it's a mix of regulation and it's a mix of markets. And we need some of that in critical infrastructure too, where um, these are regulated markets and there's a reason for that. These people rely upon them. There's harm that could come from people if they don't work properly. And I do think we're gonna have to look at some of those recommendations from the Solarium Commission, some of the recommendations from the commission under President Obama that still haven't really been embraced to really help nudge some of those critical infrastructure to sort of do better and to, to be more, more secure and, and more cyber resilient. One of the issues that we think about at the Lincoln Network is how institutions and uh, relate to governance. Uh, a focus of our work has been strengthening Congress and the legislative branch, thanks in part to the Hewlett Foundation's Madison Initiative and your generous support. When it comes to cybersecurity, one of the conventional views of, of people on Capitol Hill and in the uh, think tank community is that we really have um, ne don't necessarily have the institutions, the capacity, the workforce, and the expertise that we need to tackle these big challenging issues. I was hoping to get your thoughts on the, uh, the state of cybersecurity, state capacity, yeah. and our ability of our institutions to confront these challenges. We yeah. haven't seen a cyber 9-11, but we've seen increasing attacks against uh, school systems through ransomware, hospitals, and of course the private sector and the ongoing you know, economic espionage. Where do we stand as a nation um, in terms of our capacity to address these threats? I think at the state and local level, we're improving, but but we're not where we need to be. I mean, if you think about it, the most expert, well-resourced parts of the US government can't secure themselves. Sure. Um, I mean, shadow brokers, Vault 7, I mean, literally the most sensitive hacking capabilities of the US government were pilfered and leaked. And obviously that was presumably by like really, really highly resourced nation state adversaries, but still if the US government can't keep itself secure, you know, um, it stands to reason that smaller states and localities with less resources and less expertise are going to do much worse. And that's the case, right? So I, th I think you have a couple things going on. One is that state and local jurisdictions are both a source of policy law and regulation, right? Given our federal system, there are certain things that they can regulate. California's uh, new work on privacy standards and, and having a, you know, um, data privacy authority and things like that are quite unique and, and data breach notifications. And so it's interesting because states are learning and promulgating new rules to try to keep their citizens safe. But at the same time, they're also, as you pointed out, um, the victim of attack. And so I do think you see a difference in capability across states, right? Um, you know, some states have capable state level chief information security officers, CISOs, like the state of California or New York or what have you. But then you have some smaller states that just don't have as much expertise. Um, but the neat thing is that you're seeing a lot of innovation and, and, and you actually are. You're seeing a lot of states call on their national guard, creating new state guard and interesting groups to pull expertise from the private sector in to help defend the state, um, to defend hospitals, critical infrastructure at the state and local level, um, you know, mass transit, schools, all those things you mentioned. And some of the states doing the most impressive work may not be those that would immediately come to mind. But I mean, Ohio is doing really interesting work. Michigan is. It, it, it's really an interesting smattering. Washington state. If you want to read more about that, my colleague Monica Ruiz has written about some of those efforts in lawfare and elsewhere. And it's really interesting to see 
You also see city CISOs sort of coming together, um, collaborating, sharing information, lessons learned. And you're also seeing universities like Indiana University. Uh, Indiana Bloomington has a great cybersecurity clinic where they actually work with state and local government and small and medium sized enterprises to help defend them, you know, investigate attacks, um, help them put in place better cybersecurity. So I guess what I'm getting at is you can get an all of society approach at the state and local level, and you just have to get more creative to find the expertise that you need to sort of defend because ransomware is lucrative and it's really easy to find a hole in a, in a hospital, for instance, which really then impacts people's, you know, um, care. And so, so I, I think you're seeing again, a slight evolution, but we're still not, not where we need to be. There's still a lot of work to be done. In terms of uh, what can be done from a, a public policy perspective or from a philanthropic perspective, are there any gaps you'd like to see closed or initiatives yeah. you'd point us to? Yeah, so I think I think there there are always gaps. Um, so I think I think one is that we're firm believers that government and the private sector cannot solve these cybersecurity challenges alone. Like that's that's been clear for for years. You need private citizens, high net worth individuals, philanthropists to step up. Whether it's the Hewlett Foundation, whether it's internet pioneers like Craig Newmark, um, really supporting some of these efforts. And so you do have state and local, you know, foundations in the state of Colorado, for instance, supporting their cybersecurity center that. Senator-elect Hickenlooper, former Governor Hickenlooper, got started. And so I wanted to say is that family foundations, community foundations, there's a role for them. I think there's also really a role for schools and universities to educate and to train and to work on that talent pipeline. Because we always talk about how we need more people, but there's demand. But where does the supply come from? And I think one aspect of that supply is really making that pipeline more diverse and inclusive. And that's really what we're trying to do is build a, a robust field of, of experts who can help different levels of government, different kinds of companies solve these problems. But we also need that talent to represent society that it's serving. And right now, there are some pretty acute systemic barriers um, to, to people of color and others joining the field. And I think so So one big gap is that talent pipeline and really breaking down the barriers. And I think universities have a key role to play there because we really need, we need lawyers, we need business people. We don't just need technologists working on cyber. We need that multiple disciplines working in unison. And so I, I think there's some really fun room there to innovate. Just like Indiana University's lab, there's um, there's a clinic at UC Berkeley doing something similar. So just to say public universities are helping to lead the way. So so a lot, a lot more there where other schools could copy and adapt and innovate some more. That's great. Let's turn to um, the outcome of the election. And while votes are still being counted, it's certainly looking like we're going to soon be talking about the incoming Biden administration wanted to get your thoughts on how a new uh, Biden administration will take uh, take changes in cybersecurity. Um, it's, it's unclear what the Hill will look like, but it continues to look like the Senate may remain in Republican hands. If you're advising President Biden and what are you hearing that they will be taking on uh, potentially in cybersecurity policy? Sure. So, so just to keep my lawyers happy, the Hewlett Foundation is a 501c3 public charity and we don't lobby, um, but you know that I'm, I'm just teasing. But but, but I, I do think um, it's interesting because I, I think cybersecurity is not as partisan of an issue as many other issues that have come up in the election. It only became partisan because, you know, really um, the White House and the Russia, you know, investigation and, and denying that some of Russia's malicious activity really cast a partisan lens on some of it. But I do think that what you saw generally from the Trump administration, from from um, Director Krebs and others, was a continuation of many Obama policies. Um, and I, I think that a Biden administration will largely be very much continuing a lot of those same policies. If you look at the Solarium Commission, a lot of those recommendations build directly off the recommendations from the committee that that the commission that President Obama. Uh, launch that that Tom Donlin helped lead. And so just to say that I think there will be a lot of continuity. I think the differences will be meaningfully different in tone and messaging, right? Like there will be consistency. There will be a strategy. Um, it will not be localized to Biden's whims and, and, and what he's hearing from certain news stations. There will be a cohesive, coherent strategy. I also think that we need to manage expectations here because I would assume that the priorities of the administration will be getting the economy back on its feet and addressing the pandemic. There will not be a lot of political capital and room to focus on cyber for the first two years. I think one exception there could be the Solarium Commission, which has pretty strong bipartisan support on the Hill. And that could be one way to try to pursue some of the recommendations for, say, creation of a national cyber directorate uh, or national cyber director. And that is one piece that will be different. I, I do think you'll see the Obama administration look at how do we empower the bureaucracy and senior appointed officials to work on these issues as opposed to carving out roles and getting rid of them at the NSC or elsewhere or 
for sort of politicizing the intelligence community, some of the things that undermined the bureaucracy's ability to manage these threats, I think you'll see the reverse. I also think on international cyber policy, you'll see a meaningful difference. China, I think just like the previous panel discussed quite, you know, quite expertly, I, I do think the rhetoric on China um, is generally here to stay. I think some of the more aggressive policies are probably here to stay. But what you'll see is consistency. It won't be a willy nilly approach to China based on, again, the president's whims or whether he likes one company or not. It'll be consistent as to say, like, what is China? Is it an adversary? If so, OK, then what are the strategic imperatives? Same with Russia, same with others. Um, and I think I, I think, you know, what you'll see in terms of regulation versus private sector engagement, I think you'll see a bit of both, right? I think it'll depend on the issue. Um, and I, I don't think it's gonna be sort of like an overly regulatory or an overly laissez-faire approach. Again, it'll be a hybrid continuation of what we saw previously. Um, but I do think it will be nice um, to go back to a cyber conversation that is very bipartisan and inclusive and not as politicized um, as it had become a little bit. You mentioned on the regulatory side, um, part of my, um, thinking goes back to the Obama administration and their approach to cybersecurity. And a question I have is if and when uh, the Biden administration begins to look at new legislation, are we going to see something more like what we saw in 2011 and 2012 when they, Obama pursued a more you know, dramatically more regulatory approach or more of the continuation of the public-private partnership model of the executive order of 2013 yeah. And it, and it strikes me, I was on the Hill at the time, there was a lot of you know, bipartisan cooperation that ended around uh, 2014, 15, 16. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a good question. I think it's, it's, it's hard to know, right? Like I'm, I'm reading the tea leaves, step, steps removed as are we are all. Sure. I, think, I think the easy clear answer is there will definitely be robust public private partnership, right? Like there's no reason to stop that. CISA has really ramped that up. The NSA is getting better at it. State and local authorities are getting better at it. Um, I think the question is, you're right, like what if any regulatory um, or more government forward approaches will there be? And I think it's too early to tell. I think partially it depends on what's the composition of the cabinet, what's the composition of, of Congress. I mean, I think a lot of the Senate's gonna turn on on Georgia, it seems, which which, which is interesting. Sure. Um, but I think, I think it really does different, right? Because I could imagine, depending on what the personality is of the Secretary of, of Commerce, Treasury, you know, state, Otherwise, like I, I think you could see meaningfully different approaches. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit of like which camp, if you're of the view that there are still like a, you know, a, a Bernie camp or a Hillary camp or whatever the case may be within a Biden administration, you know, how, how um, uniform are those views or how different are they? And, and again, like it's not totally clear to me, but, but I, I really don't think in the first two years you're going to see a lot of appetite for legislation on this, again, unless it really comes from the Hill, because I, I think the administration is going to be fighting tooth and nail just to get some really urgent things done um, that, that most Americans are clamoring for, and, and cyber is going to have to sort of wait its turn in line. One last uh, question about the potential Biden administration. Do you think we'll see a, a dialing back or a continuation of the deterrence policy of yeah. the Trump administration? So this is, this is like one of these things that's like fascinating, right, about the cyber community, that it's like, um, we still don't actually know what the Trump administration changed um, from from because like there's been no transparency, right? Like they reportedly revoked a, a PDD um, to give a cyber command and, and, and DOD, um, you know, more free reign to sort of engage in offensive cyber operations. And they they kept promising to declassify portions of the new order or whatever and, and like never ended up doing any of that. And so this is all speculation based upon basically a not like sourced reporting. And so like it's really hard to tell because I don't actually, I would argue we don't actually know what's different now. I, I think we're just relying on people sort of in the know hinting at things. And so um, I, I think the corollary to that is it's really hard to know if, if let's assume for the sake of argument, Cyber Command has been persistently engaged and defending forward and, and all of that, to what impact? And again, like we don't know since it's so highly classified, which some of it should be, some of it shouldn't be. So it's really hard to assess it, right? So. I, I think what you'll see is, uh, you know, there'll be there'll be a look at that, right? Like those folks with clearance in the White House will take a look at it and say, like, are all the equities from all of our different policies being taken into account? And if they're not, well, we may need to make sure that certain people have a seat at the table who don't right now. Um, I don't think you're going to see them like locking it down as aggressively as perhaps the Obama administration did with the as many levels of review and all that. But so you may see a hybrid. But again, like I, I think the starting place, if if you know. Um, somebody wanted to advise the Biden campaign or the administration, 
um, which I'm not doing, of course. Um, it, you know, like, I, I think it's reasonable to, to say that, like, transparency is important here because we can't have an informed conversation if we don't actually know what's going on. And so I think one place to start is to think about, like, just like Michael Daniel wrote a detailed blog post about many of these things, that would be a great way for the Biden administration to search. Like, let's talk about what the current policy actually is and how we're thinking about it. Well, keeping the classified stuff classified, we can still sort of tell you more so that we can have a smart conversation about this. Because I, I think there are some really good things to talk about there, but it's just a little a little unclear to me. Um, but I think for the time being, people seem to trust Nakasone, think very highly of him, think very highly of his team around him. Politico, Garrett Graff wrote a great piece about him that really explains a lot of why he's built up that trust and respect. And so I think that gets him pretty far and, and gives him a bit more... Um, uh, a bit more leeway um, than perhaps others would have in a, in a similar similar position in a in a transition. On this point about personnel, um, it strikes me that the being atop the list of the new administration will be trying to get the right people into the right yeah. positions. Do you think that we'll see a return of uh, the cyber coordinator in the White House? That's been a contentious issue. Yeah. And, I, yeah. I mean, I would assume you're going to see a more senior role in the White House. I don't know what it would be. I think that like there will be some people pushing for the creation of something even more senior, like the National Cyber Director, as yes. um, advocated for by the Solarium Commission. I think the easier, quicker thing is, yeah, you put in a senior person at the NSC, a la Michael Daniels role or something, you know, you call it or, you know, it, it's the old Lisa Monaco role that also has cyber in the name. Like there are different ways to do that. But I think the way that cyber was pushed down in the Trump NSC to like a senior director level, like those days are long past. This is way too important of an issue area for it to sort of reside at that level. So they may do an interim thing. Um, I think I think it'll be really interesting, right? Um, and they may think about a broader reorg, right? Because CISA still is not fully as empowered as say the NCSC is in, in the UK. And so I can imagine ways where you want to more fundamentally rethink how US is organizationally set up to manage cyber. But again, I, I don't think those broader things are at all doable, probably in a first term, just because like, the bandwidth and the appetite to do that, I don't think it's going to be there. So like if Congress supports the National Cyber Directorate, my guess is like that'll be embraced by the White House. Yeah. If there's a lot of angst on the Hill, like, again, they're not going to use their political capital on that. They'll create a Michael Daniel type role and like that'll be good enough. You raise a great question about uh, CISA. It seems to me that that agency has a lot of responsibilities beyond cyber. They're yes. working on school shootings. They're working on chemical facilities. People forget about that, but they have a whole laundry list of tasks. So a great question. Yeah, the, the, the I in CISA keeps Chris Krebs very busy. Oh, as well. of course, yeah. yeah. It's often over. Yeah. Um, I had one last topic to, to discuss and wanted to invite our guests today to ask questions. Uh, but before turning to our questions, I wanted to ask you to talk about one of the projects that you've led, which is updating the cyber visuals, um, the imagery that we all see in the uh, cybersecurity articles that we read. I was tempted to put on a hoodie um, and turn down the lights um, because we're all familiar with the the hacker uh, ominously looking at their laptop. Um, can you talk about that? Um, sure. That effort that you led and how that fits into your approach. As you do, yeah. so, I'm going to take over the screen and show some pictures. That's good. Please do. Please do. Yeah. So this is one of my favorite projects that we've done, which you know may sound a little silly at first, but I think is actually very substantive. Which is um, one of the challenges with cyber policy and cybersecurity is just explaining it to people and making it intelligible. These people constantly hear this sort of fear-based narrative and it makes them feel powerless, right? It's like the hackers are coming for me, the Russians are coming for me, whatever. And it doesn't actually let them know what they should do to actually stay safe and that they can actually, you know, be in more control than they are. And that goes to the immaturity of the field, right? It's like it's a newer field, the policy debate's immature. Think about how far the climate change debate has come, or even how public health communicates during a pandemic. When you listen to it, it's come a long way, right? And, and you need a visual language to be able to show pictures to really make it resonate and for people to really get it. And so we realized one of the obstacles to, to sort of having a more mature, sophisticated conversation about these issues is like, we can't show pictures of it. Like ones and zeros, what do they mean? Uh, uh, you know, disembodied like, head like in front of a computer screen, a server rack, a hacker and a hoodie again, like doesn't actually explain how our core values, our intention and these digital technologies bring that to the fore. And it's really important to think this stuff through. And so we funded a global contest to get artists really energized because like, I'm not creative in the sense of being able to be a graphic artist. And so we, we, we ran a global contest with entrants from all around the world and created this website to host the best images. And we want people to use them. They're openly licensed. Lincoln can use them. 
anybody can use them so long as you attribute it to the artist. And the whole idea here is to show we can get more creative and connect with people and tell better stories. And that's really important if we want to do better on cyber. And so some of the images I think are really cool. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, glad that you're, you're willing to, um, to put some of them up. Yeah, um, I like this one on the, the China um, arms race. I think this is an interesting way to, to show this. The, um, looking through them, I, I enjoyed this one on encryption, showing mm -hmm. yeah, all better than the, the hoodie hacker. Yeah. Um, let's go to turn to some questions. Um, do we overclassify information about technical systems uh, security from Matt? I guess so, like without knowing more exactly what you're getting at, it's hard for me to say. I, I guess what I would say at a high level is because a lot of the US's most advanced technical capabilities in cyber come from the intelligence community, they're cloaked in secrecy. And there's a cultural aversion to being transparent and open that that you know exists for a very good reason. In the post Snowden era though, like that doesn't work. Like citizens of a democracy demand and deserve to know more what its government is doing in its name especially when those activities really involve, you know, harm and, and geopolitical competition. And so I, I, I'm of the view that what Admiral Rogers started, what General Nakasone has continued needs to be ramped up further, which is you need to talk more, you need to show more, you need to be more open so that scholars and citizens can really dive into these issues. And, and, and one sort of example to go to like technical knowledge is, you know, if you like, we can talk about how the U.S. should or should not deploy nuclear weapons and what capabilities it needs without having a Q clearance, which is like to understand how nuclear weapons operate. Like you do not need anything close to that clearance to actually have an informed debate on those topics. The same could be said for certain cyber capabilities. And I think I think like I hate nuclear analogies in cyber because they're really bad, but the overclassification here is an impediment to having a real conversation and having good academic study, research by think tanks and the like. So we, we do need to do better. And, and part of that is technical knowledge, yeah. On that issue of, um, of engaging with uh, different communities and sharing information, we're coming up on five years of the information sharing bill of 2015. As we're um, winding down, any your thoughts on, for a long time, that was viewed as the solution. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, information sharing is clearly critical, but like there's a reason why it's not in and of itself enough, right? Because either the way it's set up doesn't work because the government won't or doesn't share good, useful, timely information. Um, there isn't trust, which is why the private sector and others won't share back. Um, medium and small enterprises have no capacity to absorb any of that information and share it. So it's like, you're a small or medium-sized company, you're even a medium-sized bank. You know, what do you have, one security guy, maybe two? Um, what are they supposed to like? So, so again, like, I, I just think that paradigm, like, at a high level, it works for sophisticated consumers. It doesn't, because enterprises, like if you're a major bank, you're Google, like as you work your way down to even smaller critical infrastructure, it breaks down. And so you have to find a way to make it work. And I think a lot of it goes back to, you know, trust and incentives. And if you're not incentivized to act on the information that you're given and invest and hold yourself accountable, then like, it's like, great, you have this information and you can't actually use it and you don't make use of it. So so I, I think it's great to continue to make progress on information sharing, but it's definitely not the panacea that the summit hoped. I agree. We're almost out of time. So I wanna close by thanking you, Eli, for sharing your time and expertise with us and give you a chance to offer any final comments. No, just thanks again. I think, I think what Lincoln is doing is really important here. And I think the more we talk about these issues, the more we try to bridge the technical communities, the tech community, the policymaking communities in DC, around the country, um, we all benefit. And I think I think it's clear from this election that part of why this election, the elections administrators, the local officials, like they did a really good job in part because they had support from and partnership with technical folks and companies and, and everybody coming together. And regardless of one's political views and how one voted, mm -hmm. just supporting that safe election and putting up defenses and safeguards to foreign interference, I think is critical. And I think we as a country clearly have a lot to work with on domestic misinformation and, and domestic challenges, but, but really just to, to, to give everybody who worked so hard and had so many sleepless nights, like they deserve the praise. And I think everybody should, should you know, give them a round of applause in one way or another this week, given, given how well everything went. Excellent closing remarks. Thank you so much for your time, Eli. We really appreciate Thank you. It. Have a good weekend.